Thank you for joining us, Professor. Um, thank you for sharing your ideas with South Korea's market participants. Um, the country's rising debt has prompted warnings. Accumulating government debt could be a burden for future generations. Um, you wrote the book, The Defense of the Public Debt. Um, today, South Korean intellectuals gather here in Seoul um, to learn from your perspective. Uh, would you explain the global public debt issue for Asia's fourth largest country? So the general issue, which is relevant to all countries, is when you are faced with a public health emergency and uh, economic crisis, governments have to mobilize all available resources to meet that emergency. And that may require borrowing uh, in order to uh, provide the necessary resources on short notice to the public health system, to provide support for households and so forth. And I think it's entirely appropriate. It was prudent and wise for the US government and the South Korean government to do that in 2020 and 2021. But events have consequences and the pandemic has the consequence of leaving behind it, bequeathing high levels of public debt. So in the United States, that means public debt in the hands of the public of about 100% of GDP. In South Korea, it means, uh, if I understand correctly, by 2022, public debt in the hands in relative to GDP of about 50% of GDP. And if nothing else is done, closer to 60% of GDP by 2025. So is that a problem for South Korea? The answer to that question, like uh, the answer to many economic questions is it depends. And it depends among other things on how uh, prudent the government is in terms of its spending going forward. Will it move the budget back toward balance in future years. It depends on whether there is another economic, financial, public health, geopolitical crisis or not. And it depends on the relationship between the growth rate of the economy and the interest rate that the government has to pay on the debt. So from the last point of view, Korea is in a relatively good position at the moment. The real interest rate on 10-year treasury bonds in Korea is about zero. Uh, the nominal interest rate is 2.4%. The inflation rate is 2.4%. So the real interest rate the government pays on the debt is zero. And we have reason to hope that the economy will grow by two or three percent. So that means you will be growing the denominator of the debt to GDP ratio faster than you'll be growing the numerator or the debt, and you can shrink the debt relative to the size of the economy. All of that arithmetic is contingent on, it depends on what happens to interest rates and growth rates going forward. And none of us have a crystal ball. None of us can say for sure. Um, then thank you for your insights. Um, the, as you said, the government has established uh, the midterm debt ceiling uh, at 60% of GDP by 2025. Um, is this accumulation sustainable? Um, I want to ask you about the sustainability of this um, public debt burden. Uh, the, as you said, the 10-year KTP is m much lower than the years ago. However, um, the debt servicing cost is low now. But how, um, is this low rates environment um, can um, persist? Can it be continued? If you look at at financial markets, they are expecting a relatively low interest rate environment to persist. They're not acting as if they expect a sudden, sharp increase in interest rates anytime soon. Uh, financial market participants could be wrong about that. Markets have been wrong before. But if uh, savings rates remain relatively high in China, and Germany and Saudi Arabia, uh, if savings rates 
move up in countries like the United States where inequality has been rising. And we know that the wealthy have relatively high savings rates, then Ben Bernanke's global savings glut will persist. And so too will the, uh, the low interest rates. That's the hopeful scenario. There is also a more troubling scenario where consumption in China rises to more normal levels as they build out their social safety net, where investment picks up as economies recover, where governments continue to run large budget deficits, interest rates could move up and that will make debt sustainability much trickier. So um, as I said before, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't forecast which scenario is more likely, but I think prudent governments plan for the worst. They have contingency plans. They put themselves in a position where they can sustain heavier debts. They can sustain their debts at higher interest rates. And that means moving back in the direction of budget balance. And that currently is what the United States is planning to do in 2022. So I'm struck by the fact that the Korean government currently is planning to move in the other direction of even larger budget deficits. I think on current interest rates and growth rates, South Korea can sustain those policies, but we can't say with assurance that current interest rates and growth rates will persist. I want to ask you about the consolidation of the uh, public debt. Um, uh, so it should be uh, done by uh, the faster economic growth. That's a one way. Uh, if the difference between the interest rate and the growth rate come down, uh, heavier debt can be more sustainable, as you said. Um, but the aging population, uh, I worry about the population structure of this nation. Um, it's not good for the fiscal burden. So uh, I guess the ministry has the contingency plan, but uh, what, are, what other factors justify this unprecedented debt? So the, the premise of your question is exactly right. Uh, growing the economy is the painless way of dealing with a heavy inherited debt. There really are three ways of approaching debt consolidation, running government budget surpluses, which is difficult politically, having some inflation, which is not always pleasant, uh, inflating away the value of the debt, and growing the economy, which is the painless way, the happy way of achieving debt consolidation. So this is a big difference between the United States and South Korea. Our demographics are different. Um, we both have debates over immigration, but we have more immigration into the United States than does South Korea. Um, we both have uh, discussions of what can be done to encourage fertility, but we have higher fertility rates in the United States than in South Korea. So that makes it easier for us to grow our labor force over time and, 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 and grow the absolute size of the economy. Uh, I think international experience shows that there are public policies that can be used to affect the reproduction rate, uh, fertility rate, how many kids families have um, generous tax policies toward children, better provision of childcare facilities for so mothers can go to work. These topics will be familiar to you in South Korea. And I think South Korea, like Japan, is going to have to have more of that difficult discussion about the need for immigration to keep the labor force from shrinking. The government bond um, plays a key role uh, in managing the growth paths of the economy and solving uh, social problems uh, like the wealth gap. And maybe it can, um, uh, it can implement the social welfare so it can grow the birth rate too, maybe. Uh, would you summarize the role of the government bonds for uh, people in Korea and the participants of this conference? So. Uh, my co-authors and I, in our book, 
look at the historical role of public debt and the development of, of government bond markets in financial development and economic development. So in many economies, including in South Korea in the 21st century, government debt is the safe and liquid asset that's widely used as collateral for other borrowing and lending transactions. So it's an important source of liquidity for growing uh, financial markets, which serve economic growth. Secondly, if you think back to that seminal moment in South Korea in 1997, 1998, when South Korea had its financial crisis, part of the problem there was that uh, finance in South Korea was so heavily based on the banks. The banks did all the lending. And if there was a trouble in the banking system, South Korea didn't have a spare tire, as Alan Greenspan famously put it. Another uh, uh, mechanism for getting money from savers to investors. Uh, and the bond market is that other way. So there's been an Asian bond markets initiative. South Korea is, is probably the economy in the region most successful at growing its bond market in the last 20 years. And uh, management of the government bond issuance is kind of the foundation, the, the, the bedrock on which corporate bond markets more generally are built. I like the expression, um, the foundation of the fund. Um, and with the second question was that, um, however, the public concerns, uh, it can be a foundation, but the public concerns, the increase in KTP issues, uh, it can uh, make the burden of future generation heavier. Uh, what do you think about this? So again, I think what's important when one thinks about burdens on future generations is how large the debt is relative to the economy. Again, uh, the, the fact that you have billions of won of government debt out there is not the right measure. The right measure is how much government debt is out there compared to the size of the economy. So uh, the government debt is a burden on future generations only if it's large relative to the incomes, uh, the taxes paid by those future uh, generations. The other point that's really important to ask about is uh, to what purpose are the funds that the government mobilizes by issuing bonds, to what purpose are those funds being put? If they're being invested productively, then uh, the economy will grow faster, the government's revenues will grow faster, ability to service the debt will increase automatically and painlessly. But if the government is borrowing in order to make transfer payments and spend on social programs for the elderly or whomever that don't translate into faster economic growth, then yes, there's more reason to worry about the burden on future generations. So I understand that a uh, good deal of the additional government spending programmed by the government for 2022 in South Korea is going to be spending on social services for the elderly to uh, address inequality problems in South Korea, as opposed to uh, investing in infrastructure or whatever. In the United States, we're having a debate over the same thing and here I think the answer most people come to is it's, it's okay and it's not a burden on future generations if the government borrows to invest in productive physical infrastructure, mm -hmm. roads, bridges, airports, et cetera, or to invest in productive social infrastructure, better education, early childhood ed ed education, continuing lifetime education that makes for more productive workers and that in the long run grows the economy. So the key is not only how much debt is the government incurring, but why is it incurring that debt and what is it doing with the resources? Mm, um, thank you for your answers. Um, then 
the last question is that what are key factors for balance between ensuring fiscal soundness uh, or fiscal responsibility and pursuing the role of government bonds like um, um, like enhancing the productivity of the na uh, nation's economy or um, narrowing the inequality. Uh, lastly, um, please give us your advice for the future of the nation's economy and bond markets, please. In South Korea's case, uh, to elaborate what I said before, I don't think there's any reason to panic mm -hmm. about current or uh, short run future levels of indebtedness uh, at current interest rates and current rates of economic growth. Uh, South Korea's government debt looks entirely sustainable to me, but it is important to make contingency plans to know what the government is going to do in terms of raising additional taxes or cutting spending if interest rates go up and if uh, problems of, of debt sustainability do develop. Um, so uh, I trust that those uh, plans are being formulated within the ministry and within the government. And I, I, I think financial market participants will be reassured and uh, markets will be calmed when the ministry and the government shares those contingency plans with, uh, with the public. And thank you again for having this interview with us and joining this uh, conference uh, with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, too.